Hey yeah, guys, okay. Uh, good to see you all here. Uh, I don't know how many people will see me, I hope some will. Uh, we'll try to have a very, hopefully, interesting for you talk, especially if you're doing some of the you know, offensive security. We'll see. We'll see where we're going to go. So I'm going to start, obviously, with a little bit of a question. You know, you, you've got a list of things, list of games you want to play. On top, you've got vulnerability management, governance, risk and compliance. On the bottom, you've got offensive, offensive security and, you know, 8-bit game that is global terror on nuclear war from the war games. Hands up if you want to play something from the top of the list. All right, hands up if you want to play something from the bottom of the list. I've much more hands risen here, and so you are in the right crowd, we, uh, you know, and, and that's the reason I want to talk to you. Uh, so, the subject of this talk is your team, your red team is missing a point. And who am I? I tend to introduce myself as the Forrest Gump of Scottish Cyber. Because I'll, just like on this photo, Forrest Gump standing next to the Kennedy, you know, I've been in most of the places where important things happen in Scottish Cyber. So, uh, you know, Fede was supposed to be talking to you just, you know, an hour ago. Uh, and so it happens that Fede hired me 11 years ago. I worked with him in a company called Bacta that became ECS Security. We've created the first SOC for one of the UK banks, first cyber SOC for one of the UK banks, together with many other good people there. Uh, then I went on to other banks. I was a person that got the first global Splunk instance into one of the major Scottish banks, the other one of the two. Uh, and you know, so that's me. What I'm doing now, I'm the head of information security at Heineken. You probably know the brand. You probably don't know we've got about 300 different brands under that name. Uh, and why I'm here is because over the years, working in many companies, including KPMG, where I run, run all the red, not red teams, all the offensive security for Scotland, uh, I manage the engagements. I never done fantasy myself, but I run all the engagements. I worked for many organizations where I was on the receiving end of the engagements. And you know what? I would say 5% of them were good. Most of the time, the engagement was terrible, unfortunately. It's got better, it's getting better, it's getting better through, like Ben said, the community working together, people working together and getting better. So, I also, before these talks, talked to a number of CISOs, other CISOs, a number of head of security, and and what they say is scary to me, because one of the statements heard is like, oh, I'm just going to do without any pen testers and red teamers now. It's just, there is so much trouble with what we're getting right now that we're just going to go the automated route. I'm like, you know, right now, I would be waiting almost for somebody to boo me from the audience and say, come on, you cannot run a red team as an automation. You need intelligence, you need something more than just an automated program to run a red team. But here it is, I spoke to one of the guys leading quite a big team of experts and he's like, yeah, I can't deal with it anymore, I'm just gonna go for robots. So, just to make sure I don't say this talk from just one perspective, the perspective of a person who manages engagements and, you know, is on the receiving end of those reports and engagements. I also talked to some of my friends, and that's the power of community. You know, I reached out to those three guys last Tuesday, and within you know an hour or two, I had you know interviews scheduled with them to talk to them about their perception as red teamers. So Aaron here looks a very young guy. He is looking quite young when you see him. He's still quite young, but within four years from graduating of the university undergraduate course. He's already a manager at KPMG doing offensive security. He's doing something wrong. Right. <laughs> Not wrong. Uh, and actually, that's opposite to some of the other stories. We've got Dan, who, who is exactly a work we've done before in SecureWorks for a company called DNS that was here in 2009. And Conrad, who I also met through KPMG. There is one more figure I'm going to introduce later, uh, also from the same area, but you know, always question where people is where the person talking to you is taking their sources from. Do they actually know what they're talking about? Uh, so the question is, can robots replace the, the red teamers? 
And whenever you see a heading like that in the newspaper, the automatic answer is no. If somebody would be sure of the heading, they wouldn't put a question mark at the end. I don't believe robots can replace red teamers. And uh, for everybody here who doesn't exactly know what the red teaming is, uh, and also because I believe that whenever you are in the room, you're explaining it, whatever you're talking about to everybody in the room, including my daughter here. So you're ex explaining something to the 12 year old in this case. And that's almost the attention span of the senior executives in any organization I've seen. If you're showing them a pen test report, they will only look at it for about a minute and it's like, oh, enough, I'm back to my business stuff. <laughs> so, red teaming, for those who don't know, is the stealthy way of testing an organization, making sure that the protocols in the place to detect uh, an offender we felt or adversary within the organization are all right. And how it's different for vulnerability testing? You know, vulnerability testing, you would have a scheduled test by a machine, and in the red team, you would get to the point that it's a stealth, very sophisticated attack. Um, so, let's talk you to a few engagements that I've discussed with my friends and the engagements I've been on. Some of them are not exactly real. They've made up a few different stories punched together, just like a movie on Netflix. But that's hopefully will give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're talking about. So imagine you're an old red team, you're outside this fortress here. That's actually Dubrovnik. You can probably recognize it from the Games of Thrones. Uh, but you're outside of this fortress, probably on this hopper boat there, armed, you've got plenty of offensive tools, you're ready for the action, you need to get in to the fortress, find the crown jewels, get them out undetected. You're being told that the CISO there is quite tough. You know the team there is ready for you. The blue teamers have been through it plenty of time. They're not afraid of you. You just say, hold my beer. So you go in and actually it's like they weren't ready at all. It's an easy scenario. You do some OSINT for you know, a day or two. You send a few emails. And in, the, you know, in half a day or less, you've got elevated access to some DLL injection because somebody had not put quotes around the path parameters. And then you, you're getting to domain admin in 20 minutes because you, you attack the land manager and, and you know, provide some spoofing on the network. So, uh, you know, you've got it. You're there 20 minutes into engagement pretty much. People were paying 50,000 pounds, 200,000 pounds for it, and you've done it within 20 minutes of actually starting to warm up. So you spend another two weeks doing something, attacking the domain admin in another way. You write a report, and you think, ah, oh, CISO will find in this city. And then your report looks like that. You know, nothing intelligent about it. There is very little information that somebody can gain from it or actually you're telling somebody that, oh, that's your biggest problem. That's the critical vulnerability. It's the biggest thing you've got there. But you don't understand the playing field. You don't understand this company at all because you only look from it from the outside. But that's a, almost a good scenario because it took you not that long to get here. But what about the higher scenarios? Again, you're standing outside this fortress and you can't get in. You've been trying phishing campaigns, you tried to go on site and do some physical access to the building to actually get any sort of a basic level access, and you can't get it. You spent two weeks with it and only one person clicked something. Finally, you've got this initial access and it moves from there. You spent two weeks, so you burned about 50k doing it. So what do you do? You turn to your best coder in the organization, the best penetration tester, and say, we need something big, we need to show them, we can't just tell them it's, it took so long and we didn't get nothing. So they spent two nights rewriting, you know, some of the templates in Cobalt Strike or, or Matasploit, and then deploy it silently and it goes in. It goes in quietly. You go and you got everything you want. Actually, it goes so well that you're doing a DC sync, you're syncing all the data from the domain controller to your laptop. And then, also for the good of it, you can get the databases. But what you've done, syncing the DC, DC 
you feel like Harry Potter getting the first snitch because you actually have a golden ticket. You can now issue any authentication ticket within the environment. Great, that sounds amazing. And you dump the databases because that's just for a good measure. So you feel like that, you feel like Avengers, your team is ready for the deep leaf. And, and you've got that. I won't actually play that to you, but you can probably see it online, I'll link to it later. It's Unless you, you want to do like that, I'll, I'll, I'll get this one if you haven't seen it. Hope it will play. I don't even know how loud it's going to be. Obviously, Cecil doesn't believe it. It's like, ah, those guys didn't get anything on me. But the blue thing is sweating a little bit. Yeah, if you haven't seen this video, go, go on YouTube, search, you know, for offensive security or, you know, pen test and then see so you'll get it. It's, it's a beautiful spoof of, of that classic movie. Uh, but what happens, you're actually going to the building uh, to go the, get the debrief with, with the blue team and what's happening, they're not taking you the normal path that you would expect. You're going some dark corridors, you're, you're not going to the normal conference room. What turns out is you're ending up in uh, CISO's incident response rooms What's happening there? You look at the people there and there's a lot of tired faces and it dawns on you. Nobody told them it's a red team. CISO didn't know. Nobody in the team didn't know. You've got some video conference call going on and you recognize uh, you know, the email addresses that are shown on the screen. It's one of the EDR companies. CrowdStrike or you know, Microsoft or somebody else. And they, they look like they want to swear at you, but they only say the adversary wouldn't play that way. It's an unfair game. And you, again, it dawns on you, CISO would not call a red team. They only do it in the first hundred days of their work. Because, yes, first hundred days they want to show how bad it is, but after that they don't really want somebody can and throw everything that they've got at the company. It just doesn't make sense for them. But you laugh it off. You say, ah, I will write a report and show to them how bad they are. You spend two weeks, then another two weeks to get the report authorized, and finally you, the report goes to the CISO. And again, it looks like that. It's patchy. It doesn't really show full picture. We're back to square one. Then what CISO needs to do, they actually need to spend another week writing a report, or actually CISO's team writes a report that the CISO will understand, because your report wasn't that good. And then, the same week, they're writing a report for the execs, because they can't show the execs what, what you've written. However, the one good thing they say, oh, good that you captured the database. The vendor told us they've got such a good detection on dumping the database, nobody can do it without them knowing. Now they're going to have to buy us another tool on their cost, because that's the contracts with those people. Well, actually, that's the end, not of my talk, but the end of the red team. If, if that's how the red teams are perceived, you're not going to get a lot of engagement. There is no community there. You go there and actually they want to walk you off the building rather than say, good job. And it's not the feeling you want to have. You want to be encouraged, you want to have those high fives and say, you've done it right, thank you. No, you're not going to get it after engagement like that. So how do we assure a survival of the red team? How do we do it? What can we do? First of all, when you're starting your engagement, verify the maturity of the blue team. Don't trust what they say. Actually, go speak to the teams, find out what they're doing, how mature they are. Actually, it was quite beautiful. You probably won't read everything here, but when I submitted the, the idea for that talk at the very beginning of March, a few days later, uh, Rachel had brought that on Twitter, saying that she will not do an offensive engagement with the company if they're not mature enough. They, she will come around and help them with the basic processes and so on, but she won't do 
and offensive engagement. It just doesn't make sense. They're wasting their money. They're burying each other's money. And at the end of it, everybody's going to be frustrated and annoyed. And also, don't, slant, don't start from scratch. Don't always start from that phishing and elevating ads and everything. Sometimes you will spend two weeks and burn to 50k just to get through your initial access. Work with the blue team and assume that certain things can be done. So start at the position where you're already authenticated user and start it from there. Or start from the position where you're a third party that has some access to this company and start from there. Don't assume that every red team needs to start from scratch, but need to start from external position from that bolt outside the promo. Also, who is the threat actor? Who are who is that company playing against or defending themselves from? Is it a nation state? Outside of what happened right now in the world, and even now, nation states don't usually attack companies. Unless you're talking about you know some very small nation states that are starved of money and they're actually hacking people to get money from ransomware. They do it, but they use community tools. Uh, organized crime, that's probably the best and the biggest one here. That's the guys that actually are after everybody and everybody's money. It's fair enough. Hacktivists, not all organizations <coughs> I, you know, I would hope that you know, my organization, for example, I really hope we're trying to do good we're trying to do green things, we're trying to be actually good people, and actually this protects us to a certain degree from uh, the, you know, hacktivists. And I remember guys from Google telling me, okay, what do you do about it? I asked them, what do you do about insider threat? That's the, the last one here. And they say, we're trying to be the good employer. We're trying to listen to people. We're trying to actually do what majority want to do. So we can avoid certain things depending on who is your attacker, but find out who you should be simulating in your red team. So if, if your red team looks like they're in top, but actually the attacker is a 16-year-old guy somewhere in Oxford that actually needs to Google meme cuts, and the guys on the top will write meme cuts, your red team is a bit you know, overpowered compared to what is necessary for that client. And play fair. Exactly. Find out what the client needs, what is the maturity, and play fair. You don't want the EDR vendor to say, you know what, we watch hundreds of thousands of logs from the real attacks. Nobody ever moved like those guys. Nobody ever behaved like those guys. Because red teamers have a slightly different step around the environment than uh, the proper adversary. They move slightly different. Obviously, one day somebody may get caught out that they're actually not detecting red teamers, they're detecting uh, the, the adversaries, but still try to play fair. And, and also going back to the threat intelligence, for example, and I say that on the bottom there, find out what is the threat intelligence given to the blue team, and sometimes play a scenario exactly to the threat intelligence they've been given. If they've been told that there is a certain way of attacking organizations like theirs, try it. See whether they protected themselves from it. And if they haven't, they actually do something really bad. Okay? Also, never think less of your opponents. They're blue teams. They don't usually speak on conferences. Often. Now, now it's a bit more. But they haven't usually spoken on conferences. And the reason for it was they couldn't. They had gag orders, they had, you know, they would lose their job if they would speak too much about their jobs. So it's not that they're not intelligent or not that good, they're actually very hot people on the subject. But they can't talk about it with you. They can talk about it with other uh, uh, blue teamers. But learn a little bit about their jobs. Do a second in detection response or, or risk management. Learn what it takes. Learn how to speak to the senior management. It's a skill. Offer right along red teams and go with the trans in the trenches with the blue teams. And never go a little bit over the board with your findings. A lot of the time you read the findings and it's like, you guys are gonna die, this company is going to case to exist if this, you know, if you allow an attack like that to go through. And that's not actually the case. Tens of companies showed it before. The way the company is done. Companies die from the lack of cash. 
they don't usually die, even after a huge cyber attack, they don't usually die immediately. They run for a few years, and if the cash flow doesn't improve, that's when they die. But looking at MERS, they had an attack in 2017. Here, something on the left, NotPetya wiped, you know, what, 25,000 PCs, 4,000 servers within 10 days. That's what happened to them. They lost 300 million, you know, recovering that. But they're actually at war and doing very well in 2022. An attack that cost them 300 million and wiped pretty much the whole company. They survived, so it's about the cash flow. So don't go over your findings, be specific. Try to get a business impact. What would be a business impact of an attack that you just carried out? Often people go after domain servers. But you know, in my company, we work in, uh, we've got an OT environment that is totally separate. I don't care if you've got domain admin most of the time because you can't get to the other one, but I don't know. So, also, agree your findings with the blue team. If you've got some findings that don't agree with the other side, guess what? The stakeholders on the top are not going to be there to know what is good and what is bad, no matter how you put it in words. They won't understand it. You need to agree your findings with your opponents. And if you don't, then the trust is lost on both sides. People will start trusting you and start to stop, stop trusting you and stop trusting the blue team. And don't do the vicious thing. It's pretty much evil. You can break the environment pretty easily. Uh, and, and actually, in, in the story earlier, I said what could have happened if you made a DC sync, left it on your virtual machine, or even worse, left it on a USB drive connected to your laptop because you thought, uh, after each engagement, I'll just have, have a USB and, and keep all the data from there. If you made a DC sync, take some databases, put it on a USB that you haven't encrypted, and you lose it in the hotel room in Rio, two weeks later, that company could be breached or that data could be on the dark web or Reddit, whatever you call it. Uh, so make sure that if you do a DC sync, you take some gold tickets, delete it securely after your engagement. Don't keep it on your VMs. Don't like, oh, I'll use it one day. No, you don't have a right to use it. If you're going to go for another engagement, you're going to have to start from scratch. That's your job. So know your audience. When you're writing a report, not like at the university, the exact summary is actually for the exec. It needs to be understood by somebody who's got two minutes to read that report. The technical summary is more for you know the CISO. And finally, the body of the report is going to be for everybody else working on this issue. But there is still the need for the red team sometimes. If the company does not believe that they can be breached, if the CISO is so full of himself saying, nah, nobody's gonna get in, that's when you want the red team to shake the whole thing. That's where you want to actually uh, go for it and, and do something very offensive. In other cases, and actually I got it here, but I won't read it. The, the, the definition of a red team I read earlier wasn't full definition. It's actually from the same article, but this one is better. It's a rigorous, challenging plan, policy systems, and assumptions, <laughs> but approaching the adversarial approach so has a much better definition of what a red team is. But what I'm suggesting is, from now on, try to avoid doing red team, especially for any low maturity clients. Just don't do it. Unless you're talking about Netflix or somebody who throws the red teams at themselves every day and actually simulate an adversary there every day, do it then. But for most of the clients, go for a purple team. Go for those right along red teams. Go for being in the trenches with the blue team so we can actually ex see what's going on. In some of the engagements that I talked about earlier, the problem is you do attack somebody for two weeks, you take two weeks to report on it, and four weeks later, there is no log in the tools that actually show why the alerts did not trigger. So the whole two weeks of your work is pretty much wasted because they don't know how to detect you the next time. And that's the full idea of why you want to be there. That's why they want the red team, so they know how to detect somebody next time. So long be the red team. But now how do we get fired? Hired, not fired. Sorry, guys. I didn't have a coffee this morning yet. Hope you'll get one after that. So again, being where I am, I'm very lucky to have hundreds of people applying for jobs that I put online. I'm really 
very happy about this position and very happy how many people we've got applying for those positions and how many talented people we've got in Scotland. And you know, whenever I get it, most of the CVs, 90% of them, people will be talking about offensive security most. But obviously, I can't offer a job in my organization that is 100% offensive security. It's not what, what I do. I'm more about defending my organization. So uh, what I try to do is, yeah, we, last time we got the interviews, uh, we got all the CDs and inter initial interviews done with three candidates. And, and we had three face-to-face -face interviews. And out of the three, two people turn up, very full of themselves, tester guys, is like, especially one, he was like, yeah, see, I'd never done any proper work, but I had that client there, I'd done a penetration testing for them. But they're useless, you know, they, they can't defend themselves anything. <laughs> Don't talk like that about your clients. Be, be a nice person, be, you know, somebody who is agreeable and, and you can be easy to talk to you. There is a quite good, maybe not always good, but there is a CISO, uh, it's a CISO podcast. And in that podcast, one of the presenters is always asked, would you hire a brilliant Jack? And the answer, no matter what they do, they usually give you like, two options, hire a brilliant Jack or have something worse taken. Every time you go for the other option, because once you get somebody who is a little bit annoying into the team, the whole team disappears. The whole team gets a bit like defensive and they're like all standing off to each other in you know, peacocks. And what Tere and Ben wanted to talk about earlier, they have talked about it earlier, you want this community, you want friendly faces, you want to open up and be able to talk like human to human and learn from each other. So last year, who I hired is this guy, Leo. He came, he really focused on offenses, he really wanted to do offensive security. I couldn't initially offer that to him, but he called, came in very open-minded. He uh, done an internship over three months with me. Uh, I found some offensive security engagement I could send him on. He had passion for brewing, so I also had sent him to our Caledonian brewery and also to the Manchester brewery, who is, that is a bit more automated than that. <laughs> uh, and he really enjoyed, he learned about both sides of security, not just offensive, also defensive and, and reporting and actually speaking to senior stakeholders. And, and from there on, he, I offered him opportunities to talk to the pen testers I know, so he could learn more about the craft and get the jobs. He got few, actually, at the back of the internship, just because he was such a nice and agreeable guy, he had three jobs offered to choose from, and he selected one in Switzerland. So, in order to be where you want to be, look at job adverts, look at other people, look where you want to be in five years' time. You don't have to look further than that, I would say. Look in five years' time who you want to be. Check what is required and get it. And I know that you know, Arnold here probably look at the top of the form. He, I read his biography and I really recommend you reading his biography. He is a self-made guy. That guy has, you know, had an idea for himself. He went to the... In, in Germany, he was a bodybuilder, of course. Then he made a, a business selling uh, additives for food and things like that. Only then he went to States and he thought he wants to be an actor and he actually paid for some of those movies himself and he went to act in classic. Obviously, you know, he lost the body, but by that time he was governor of California. Very good title. He's done some nice red teaming exercises with his uh, fire services one year before the massive fires in California that saved them a lot. Uh, and finally, from a guy that couldn't speak properly in English about 20 years ago, and you could see him in the movies, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'll be there. Or, I'll be back, whatever, because he initially was a Hercules, that's a nice, nice thing. Uh, in, if you see him two weeks ago, he was speaking to Russians and asked his fellows, and the way he eloquently put everything, you showed the journey. If you think that right now, I, when I graduated from the uni, you know, I could see myself being a little bit close up, I really focus on technical stuff, I really enjoy it, I, I, I really, if I found the technology I liked, I got, you know, packet tracing and understanding packets to the big level. <laughs> I just haven't seen many people that actually go, would go that way. But then you want to grow and you want to find out where you want to be in, and have a certain lifestyle. Have a look and, and 
don't limit yourself. You can get there. It won't happen in a day, it won't happen in a year, but it will happen in two, three years. You will evolve to whoever you want to be. What can help you on the journey? Those four books, the ones that are tilted to one side are more about you know, how you perceive the world and how you can influence others. And the one that is to the right is if you, if you want to discover what drives you and why you're doing certain things the way you do as the laws of human nature. But actually, if you want to get on with people, that's a good book. It kind of is recommended to a lot of salesmen, but it's a brilliant book for everybody. It's a brilliant book about understanding what other people want. People want to be called by their name. People want to be understood, their hope is understood, and somebody who can actually be on the same line. And you never should do it. In that book, it's a warning, a huge warning. You never do it to sell something to people. You do it because genuinely you like people. You want to link to them. So be open-minded, respect others, experiment as much as you can with technology, but also with people, with people interactions, how you sell something, how you talk about something, how you discuss what you're doing every day. Explore, enjoy, and share. Work with others. Have fun. That's everything. That's the end of the talk. I think I've got a few minutes left. I, I plan for 30 minutes, and then I've got a few minutes for questions. If you've got any questions, we will talk for questions, but you may have something. Anything? No? Oh. What's your thoughts on emulating that system? Emulating them as, as a group? That's, that's a very good question. It's, I think we probably don't know yet everything, but from some of the releases, released material from Mandian and others, it looked like they pretty much Googled most of the tools for, for the things. They were very sophisticated for it, and they can not cover the tracks very well. So, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm not an offensive security person myself, but from my perspective, it would mean that exactly you're not throwing your best coders against the organization. If you want to emulate somebody like them, use what we've done already, common tools, tools that you can get online, tools that you can get on the black market, tools that you can get somewhere else. Just make sure that they don't have any backdoors. Or, or run them in, you know, in dev environments. What was your thoughts about it? Because it's, all, it's a two-way conversation. Would, would you have a suggestion? I think a six-hour window to get as far as you can means that they can bust. Thus, you know, if you try to split it and do it as fast as possible. I, 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 I think you're right. And a lot of blue teams, I, I see China picking up, but a lot of blue teams comes, you know, Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm on holiday, I'll, I'll, I'll get a pager, and I sometimes look at some pagers, but, you know, I won't look at it until Monday. And, I, I, and what I, I like about your answer and question is, I don't believe, and I run a lot of defensive operations, I don't believe anybody should be running their own 100% inside SOC. It's always going to be hybrid, and already it's hybrid because even when they say it's hundred percent internal, you say, "What about those five contractors there?" So if you're hiring contractors, you just as well hire a managed security service that sees offensive actions every day, not people that pick up something offensive every three months. So they don't have the training; they don't understand what's going on. But that's that's how I see. It. I suppose. I see a question up, up there. Yeah. So. You've explained about the importance of writing your reporting for executives and for your technical summary. Yeah. I actually think the bigger challenge isn't trying to help the blue team because the blue team is very close to the red teams. Right now, yes. I think that's the only part of it. That's why I say that is, you know, people sell red teams, but what you should be selling is part of it where they actually want to get rid of it. Yeah, I think the harder challenge, and, and this is where I take your advice, is how do you get the network team to listen? How do you get the network team to listen? You give them money. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got this challenge for, for, for some time. And it's, uh, you will find that after a while, the company will cut down the resources. And unfortunately, you're going to get to the point where you're going to have to write a cyber security backlog 
with a pot of money. It's not going to be an incumbent project. Or you you ask for the money for the next year, but some of it is for planned improvement projects, and some for it is you need to have some ad hoc improvement projects because the network team, you know, won't do anything that is outside of their budget because they don't have a budget for it. They're not going to hire anybody outside. They don't have a budget for it. Where it should come from is from the security budget, and the security budget should come from the business. And some of it needs to be ad hoc. Unfortunately, some of it needs to be a pot of money that you really do spend on an agile way, saying, guys, we just discovered something new, something bad is happening. We don't usually have the guys standing there to fix it, but we've got a pot of money to help you so we can get this consultant that we know that's been here you know, last month and actually he's shit hot and he can do it for us. Let's get him back in. That's, that's my yeah. approach. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, makes sense. So, what about organizations that have no internet to spend money on IT or security generally? That's the choice. Unless they're doing something with personal data. That's not the choice. Even organizations that don't have inclination to spend the money on IT or something, and they don't, they're not regulated by a GDPR or another thing, what, what's the worst that's going to happen is their commercial data. And Assuming we forget about personal data, it's their operations and their personal data, they don't have a, they're not national agreed, they don't have a regulator against it. The worst that can happen is they will collapse. And if they collapse, there shouldn't be any more of policy, so there should be another company that could easily pick up the clients or pick up signal services. So it's their business choice. That's, that's my view. What about you? You struggle with it. I, 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 it's, it's a painful thing, but if a company doesn't want to spend the money on cybersecurity and they don't have regulated data, if they don't have to do compliance, it's their choice. Because you know, there is a cost to security. There is a cost to managing risk. It will hold you back a little bit. It's, it's basically if you invest a little bit in security, that can make sure that you actually, when you're going to reach the top, you're going to stay on the top. But you're going to slow you down a little bit because you're going to have less pounds to invest in you getting to the top. Unless you're talking about you know, speeding up user journey. Yes, you can invest money in that. And if you can sell that to a company that if you invest in a user journey, make it more secure but faster at the same time, you're going to become more secure and actually better. So what I do with organizations like that is you dress up, and you don't just dress up, you try to sell security with improvements to the business plan. So you, you can have, for example, pink identity and say, guys, you can have identity for all of your customers, and you know who they are, you know their security, you know they can connect, you know their journey, you know everything that you need to know as a business, but also, also the, you know that you can secure their connections, you know that you can securely authenticate them. So, that's the only approach I see in the scenario where the business doesn't really want to understand that cyber is important. But also, the, the shock exercises that we just talked about, I think that's a part of the red team where actually you can go and shoot them a little bit, you know? That's why you need a red team. If somebody is like, ah, nothing's gonna happen to us, we don't care about it. Yeah, that's when you may need a red team to show them what, what is bad. Or you may just, uh, you know, a tabletop exercise for the board. That's sometimes enough. That's sometimes enough to get your buy-in. Make a little tabletop exercise. Get somebody who has been in trenches, but also a senior executive, because they need to match the seniority of the people in the room. Uh, and, and get them to talk to the board and tell them this is a story. That's the story of TSB, for example. Pretty much a local bank. It wasn't a bridge, but they told it to themselves. But that's the story of what happened after they had a huge, you know, disaster. And that's what effect, personal attack, it had on the execs. Because, unfortunately, most of the organization, unless we talk about one founder and small organization, and most of the organization, uh, you know, you need to sell and inform the individual as much as the business. Business is one thing, but you've also got individual players in the board, in the management team, what's their aspirations? Do they want to be in this place in two years' time, five years' time? Because if they only think in short term, they're probably not going to spend for cyber. But if they're thinking, I'm going to be here in five years, that's the stakeholders you want to uh, talk to. 
that stakeholders that is going to be there in five years' time because they want the company to prosper. And the chances that your company will have an attack in five years, I would say, are close to 100%. That's, that's my view. Any, any more questions? I'm not sure I have time for them, but five minutes potential. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll get my mind off the. Thank <laughs> you.